a major global catastrophe. And after that catastrophe, geologic processes have become more like modern processes. So th things have slowed down like in last slide that, that Birger showed. Um, so those are the two worldviews. <clears throat> And I, I see as I see in bio, in geology, as we understand more of the evidence, there's growing uh, awareness uh, that doesn't fit the long time scale. That is new evidence some of us are finding, and just awareness of what's out there. Uh, it doesn't fit that long time scale. So the conventional theory or, or secular theory, we use that term conventional because that's what everybody believes. Uh, ancient events must be explained by processes seen or feasible in the modern world. Whereas the biblical worldview, ancient events were probably very different, a geological catastrophe. So, ba some basic background. Well, when we talk about deposition, what is that? That's how depositing this for this sediment that makes these rocks. You deposit it by rivers or whatever it's, it's doing, is doing it. And then erosion, once you've deposited all this stuff, you cut a lot of it away, like you've seen here, a lot of this has been removed. That's the erosion. And then lithification, that's the sediment, the sand here, becoming cemented into sandstone. So those are just some common terms that we'll use. Okay, when we talk about modern processes producing geology, what are we talking about? Well, just what we see here. Some streams, rivers, uh, in a lake, sediment is depositing down underneath the water. Um, these are all modern processes, and in uniform, uniformitarianism, those have to be the processes that do everything. Here's some more modern processes on the upper right uh, under the ocean. There, there are layers being deposited by, by ocean currents and other things. Um, and uh, we don't see those, but they're happening there under the water. The one on the bottom, that's a modern flash flood. This is actually is in Loma Linda, a few blocks from where I live some years ago. Uh, there was about a week of rain that's, that, and there are hills up to the right above Loma Linda. The, set, the sediment all became saturated with water. Then the last night there was a huge downpour and it brought all that mud down here into Loma Linda. So the flash floods happen um, now <clears throat> and those can deposit sediment. Then we have the ancient sedimentary deposits. All these formations here in the Grand Canyon, there are a series of formations from the bottom up to the top. <clears throat> and you see each one of those formations is, um, uh, is very widespread. I don't know if you can even see this, but we'll try. So they go across here and they continue for hundreds of miles. Very widespread deposits, that's what I'm talking about, widespread deposits, hundreds of thousands of square miles. Okay, uh, now how do you do that? Do you do that with rivers? You know, this, you look at the one here on the bottom. This is a, called a straight cliffs formation, and uh, the locals call this thing 50 mile mountain, because it goes around the corner and it's 50 miles long and it all looks like this, these, these uniform layers. So how do you do that with a river? A river deposits sediment within its banks in the pattern that it follows. Now rivers move around. On the left you see the Mississippi River. The river is right there. And this, this part here that looks different from the rest, this is the floodplain. So through the centuries the river has meandered back and forth through this area. And so it, they do wander around. But it's still within the, it's a ribbon of sediment. Uh, in this case, maybe 10 kilometers wide, some places wider. And so that's still a ribbon of sediment, not something that covers 100,000 square miles. They're just radically different. So how can this produce this? But if you won't accept catastrophe like the flood, well, you kind of got to deal with this somehow. Okay, so look, look a little more at these, these widespread deposits that I'm talking about. Um, this one I mentioned, it goes 50 miles and it goes much farther than that. Um, here's a place called the Grand Staircase, and I'll talk more about that later, but you're looking north and you see uh, uh, there's a 
cliff here that goes again for hundreds of miles, another one above it, and two more above that. Now in this picture is this middle one. It's called the, the Navajo sandstone. All right, and when you're, when you're up on, even at the top of it, you can see it's a flat deposit. It goes uh, in one direction, 480 kilometers, in the other direction, 800 kilometers, and it's like this. All right, so how do you do that? With rivers? Uh, this is not rivers, it's, uh, it's thought to be wind, but, um, and that's a whole other picture. But th there are a number of these that we, can, we refer to as widespread, ge uh, geographically widespread formations. Okay, one, one of these that I, this is one of my favorites, this is a beautiful formation. Uh, it's called the, the Morrison Formation. And, and y you can follow this for mile after mile. And it goes from Canada almost to Mexico, covers parts of a number of states. 600,000 square miles, and that's uh, in, uh, 1 million square kilometers. Okay, river covering that, and it's thought to be rivers and floodplains and that kind of deposit. Hmm, that just really does not fit what we see happening in the world today. And yet, if you won't accept a global catastrophe, this is what you got to deal with, rivers and things like that. Um, just above the, the Morrison, we have the Dakota sandstone. That's a, about a maybe a 50 foot thick uh, layer of coarse sandstone, 815,000 square kilometers. Um, <clears throat> down here in the southwestern United States, we have the, the Chinle formation, this colorful formation, very fascinating, uh, 300,000 square kilometers. And the bottom part of that is, is called the Chenera conglomerate. That's this thing right here. 260 square kilometers. And it's, it's round pebbles like you would find in a stream bed for 260,000 square kilometers. And yet that's what it, it's interpreted as meandering streams. Well, where are the streams? Um, it, it, somehow it doesn't look right. <coughs> Modern processes don't begin to explain these, not even a slight beginning to explain these. They can only explain, be explained by continent scale, at least, processes. Okay, here's another way to look at this. <clears throat> this, this diagram here at the bottom, all three of these diagrams, are what you could, would find if you got a, a big research grant and you got a huge bulldozer and you dug a trench across the western United States, you know, thousands of feet deep. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if they'll give those grants, but anyway, this is what you'd see. And this is from actual data from the Rocky Mountain area in western United States. Notice the scale, 100 kilometers. So this is somewhere between 250 to 300 kilometers. So in the, the lower part of the geologic column, the fossil bearing part, the Paleozoic and Mesozoic, this is what you'd find if you went right after the end of the Mesozoic. These are flat-lying things that were deposited. Huge, uh, tremendous, the, the, this Mesozoic, uh, the, the Morrison, and all these different formations would, would be in here. Now, <clears throat> about the end of the Mesozoic, you start finding something happening. You start finding this folding up into mountain ranges, probably from pressures from continental drift, uh, the plate tectonics. Okay, so all this stuff gets folded up like this and broken by faults. And then in the, set, in the Cenozoic, the upper part, now new sediments begin to form in these valleys that are formed between the mountains and not unfolding down the sides, flowing down the sides. Okay, then as time goes on, in the more, more towards the modern times, you begin to see erosion. See these deposits, some of this has been eroded out and new deposits are forming. Okay, this is the modern, what's happening in the modern world. And this, this is a river, and I had to greatly exaggerate the size of that for you to even be able to see it. Okay, so this is what happens in the ancient world. <clears throat> this is the modern world. That's what happens in the modern world, these little rivers. Okay, so this is going to explain all of this. Even if you had uh, 500 million years, will that work? 
Well, the time is not all you need. You need something else. You need the right conditions, the right processes to produce this. And I don't, I think, suggest, no, it's not going to work. But if all you have are rivers, you just, you do, in your theories, you do what you have to, I guess. And, okay, and this is not just in North America. <coughs> uh, Birger mentioned uh, some things from Derek Ager. He was a, a geologist in, in the late 1900s. He, he um, made a point of traveling around the world and getting acquainted with the rock formations in different parts of the world. And he wrote a book about it. Um, and it's a very interesting book that these widespread deposits are in many places around the world. They circle the globe. This is not a local. This is not North American. Um, the White Cliffs of Dover. Okay, these are Cretaceous uh, chalks. It's a certain kind of deposit that looks like this. You find them in England, which is here, Northwestern Europe, France, Sweden, Russia. We're getting pretty far off now. Uh, Egypt, southern, southern United States, and in a place you may have heard of, Australia. Okay, the same thing. And it's just at the same place in the fossil record, in the geologic record in the Cretaceous. What's going on here? Now, uh, Derek Ager understood this is a little peculiar. And he, he, he warned in his book, creationists not to use this data to support their theory. But he, reckoned, he admitted that there's some very strange things in the geologic record. Why, why should what's happening in Australia be the same as what's happening in England at, this, at that very same time? Somehow, that doesn't compute. Something was happening on a global scale. And that's, this is the, the one we just talked about. That's just one of them. Um, and there are, there are many others. I'm just going to mention a few. Um, in, the Crete, in the Triassic, which is the, kind of the beginning of the time when you have dinosaurs, uh, there are these beds called red beds. Now you've got red rock formations in many places, but there's a certain set of, of a type of these red formations in the Triassic that are the geologists call red beds. Triassic red beds. That's very characteristic and, and recognizable. Okay, so you find these same things at the same level in the geologic column in Eastern and Western North America, Europe, Mexico, South America, China. Okay, we've pretty well covered the world, haven't we? And this, and uh, Ager mentioned he was giving a talk in, in uh, South, in, uh, I don't remember where the talk was, but he was showing pictures of these. And he showed a picture of these in South America. And a geologist there from China said immediately, Triassic red beds. <laughs> so we're not making this up. These, these things are characteristic and they, they fall around the globe. How did that happen? Well, it looks like something is happening on a global scale. Uh, Paleozoic coal beds. <clears throat> these, these thick seams of coal, which is accumulation of plant material packed together and, and fossilized. Eastern North America, going across Europe and across Russia. Okay, that's a pretty big chunk of the, of the world, these Paleozoic coal beds. And they get up to a, a thousand feet thick. And I think some of the big ones are, are here in Australia. Okay, let's look at another, get, get to a specific research example that, that I, we worked on. The Triassic Mode Kopi Formation in southern Utah in North, in North America. Um, this is the Moen Kopi Formation. You notice these layers, these, these, they're very continuous layers. This is the Moen Kopi Formation. It's, it's mudstone made out of, you might can guess what, mud. Uh, and then sitting right on top of it is the Shinera conglomerate, this, this pebble made out of little pebbles and sand. Uh, and, and here's a close-up. So there's the contact between them. And here are these, these continuous layers in the Moen Kopi formation. Dr. Arthur Chadwick and I have, have, have done quite a bit of research on this. And these beds just are very continuous. There, there are two right little ways below the, the um, chin there are these two beds we call the twin beds 
and they just go everywhere. I mean, we've, we've followed these, kind of hard to study on these cliffs, vertical cliffs. So we've flown along here in, in helicopters and taken pictures um, in order to, to see what's really happening. And they, they just go on and on and on. Um, we flew our helicopter all the way across Arizona, probably 100 miles of these, of these cliffs. Uh, we took pictures, not a few pictures. We were, we were flying along and clicking, click, click, click. And we have 6,000 photographs. Along, and this was the basis for a lot of our research that we did. Okay, and so these layers, if these are formed by local processes, why are they so continuous? And here you can see them continuous right here for maybe a, a half a kilometer. But we, we took all these pictures and you can cut them in strips and put them together and you can follow individual, reliably follow individual beds across this thing. And this, this one happens to be three kilometers. Now that some places we can we have these strips we've pieced together over 10 to 14 kilometers. And these, these individual layers are continuous. And here you have three kilometers. Then you go 218 kilometers away to the south. And here's what it's like. Now this is too far to, to be able to really trace individual layers. But you can still see it's, it's the same process that's happening. And on the other side you go 165 kilometers and here's what you have. Again, it's the same process. What's going on? <laughs> Local rivers? Well, <clears throat> you think about that. Um, it, it just looks like this is a this is a, 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 ma a massive formation over very wide areas. Things flowing in large um, flat sediment century layers for hundreds of, of kilometers. Now we'll look at another thing that I find very interesting. Something called the Grand Staircase. And this is something you find in Utah and Arizona. So this is the Grand Canyon to give a marker of where we are. This is going from north to south down into central Arizona. And here in the north we have all these, these sedimentary layers. Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic. And as you go south, this, the layers here and this, and this one drop out and, and end in a cliff. And then you get to the next, the next set of layer of uh, formations, and they end in a cliff. And so this is a series of cliffs, one above the other. Now the dotted lines show uh, the geologists think that these layers each continued at one time way down into Arizona, at least. Who knows what happens beyond that? But they've been eroded out to make this stair staircase. Very uh, fascinating. And here's. Some pictures to show you this is real. This is not imagined. This first cliff right here is this one, the Chocolate Cliffs. That's the one we studied, flew with a helicopter for 100 miles. Then above that, you have the Vermilion Cliffs, and then the White Cliffs, the Navajo Sandstone, and then two more. One is kind of hidden in the hills, but then there's the pink one at the top. The Grand Staircase, and it's a very real... Uh, phenomenon. A couple more pictures. Now we're up at the top. We're looking at right across the top of the White Cliffs, the Jurassic uh, Navajo Sandstone. And you can see there's the, the bench on one of these cliffs, and then there's the next cliff, and they go up. And so they're very real, lar very large scale uh, features. <coughs> so, how did they form? Well, I mean, how do you, the sediment, how you got the sediment got there, that's a whole other picture. But how did you erode this? Um, it, it's, it's believed to be meandering rivers, you know, wandering around the landscape and eroding down. Well, there's one problem with that. When a river erodes, it cuts either a canyon, it can, it can be, it won't necessarily be a canyon like that. It could be the river may, may wander back and forth and make a broad valley, but a river always has a bank on either side, on both sides. Okay, that's always the way it is with rivers. Now, if, if we look at the, uh, okay, the Great Staircase has no bank on the south side. There's the, there's the northern bank. There's no bank here. 
This is, this is central Arizona, and it's the Precambrian rocks down below. And if you drive through southern Arizona, it's just flat with, with volcanic mountains sticking up. Okay, so you go down this shark staircase, and then there's no more uh, of these sediments down to the ocean. Now, how did that work? Where is the southern bank? How could this, this happen? The hypothesis that best explains the evidence is catastrophic water flow over the entire region, coming from the north probably and eroding down. In, I mean, catastrophic water flow. A mass, very ma mass flood, eroding this out. Rivers just won't do it. And I, I've, I've searched the literature to find how geologists will explain this. And they don't. The, there's no paper. There's, I found one paper. And it doesn't explain how it happened. He uses, he takes, he accepts the radiometric scale as correct. And from that, he estimates that it took uh, one to nine million years for each of these platforms to, to form. But that's all. He doesn't even try to explain how it happened. Um, but I think um, um, catastrophic water flow is the only thing that will work. Okay, missing time. Paraconformities. <clears throat> well, coming back to this Moenkopi and uh, the, uh, uh, the shinner on top. Okay, how can you have missing time? Um, geology just got tired of doing things or what? Well, okay, what is that? Um, here we have the, the, sh the shinner up and the Moenkopi. And here's the division between them. And using radiometric dating, it's understood that there's a whole lot of time that is not demonstrated here by sediments. 10 to 30, depending on who you ask, anywhere from 10 to 30 million years missing here. Okay, the time obviously did pass if it was real. But the thing is, missing time means this formation was deposited and then nothing happened until this was deposited. So this represents time uh, in which either nothing was happened or something was deposited and then he wrote it away. Either way, it's, it's really the same issue. How can you have this very sharp division with not, no time represented? Okay, let's talk about why that matters. <clears throat> um, and my prediction will be there will be places where presumed Long time spans like this never existed. There was not that 330 million years uh, that passed. Okay, so at this, if this really represented 30 million years of time, you should see evidence of that time, that that time had passed. You should find um, animal burrows right here in this, in this sediment at the top. There, if there's millions of years, there should be the sediment churned up by animal burrows and tree roots and erosion and all kinds of things. That's what happens on the modern world. Things don't just sit without being disturbed. There should be, and yet there are none of those in here. We've searched carefully. There are no animal burrows, no tree roots, no nothing. And also you have, this formation makes these what we call load casts that push down into this lower formation, into the mud. Okay, this, this had to be soft for this to happen. No geologist will accept the idea that this formation stood there for, for millions of years without getting lithified into rock, staying soft, that they just will not accept that. And yet there it is. And nobody has really studied this. So there is no significant time missing. There's no evidence of the passage of time here. And this is something you can see many places. Okay, finding answers through research. <clears throat> um, we'll talk more of some specific examples in another talk, but just to, to summarize some things. Uh, some of us do geology and paleontology research. We begin with a biblical worldview, and this causes us to ask questions about the sediment we're studying. And because we start with a different worldview, we don't start with uniformitarianism, we don't start with the assumption of long time periods, this causes us to, to ask questions that others are not asking. and causes us to, or opens our eyes and opens our minds to see things that we would not see otherwise. Okay, uh, 
you'll find many places in the literature, the anti-creation literature, statements that, that um, believing in the Bible and trying to apply this will close your mind, will close your eyes to, under, to see what's going on. It'll make you biased. Is that true? No, exactly the opposite is it's true. They understand their worldview. To do research, we have to understand our worldview, plus we have to know everything they know and understand their worldview. So we're always comparing these two worldviews, looking for places where we can test between them. And so we, we ask questions and see things that others do not see. Then, once we, we ask these new questions, then we have to use science, standard science, to get answers, to study the rock. And this is the process we use. And this a new evidence that we find supports our Bible-based hypotheses and predictions. And I'm going to give you examples later. But <clears throat> to show this does work, here are some of the papers we've published uh, on, on our research. Um, there's a few more in this are very prominent geology journals, uh, also prominent geology and paleo journals. This is one from Geology. Is a, it was one of the most prestigious geology journals. And here is research that I'll tell you about later on fossil whales and our, our whale that we, we found, that we studied. Okay. <clears throat> um, the foundation. What is our foundation? Our foundation is faith and the, the Word of God. Read your Bible. And we believe God is the greatest geologist that ever lived, ever time. Pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us. And so we, we have to, we do this, and then we have to do very careful science. To do just one or the other is not going to work. We have to um, let the Bible cause us to ask new questions, and then we have to do very careful scientific work. Okay, our faith is built on the Bible, not on science. We don't the science doesn't tell, tell us what to believe. We start with the Bible. But when we build on this foundation of faith, our science gives us better answers to scientific questions. God is, is using science to encourage us by letting us find things that, that show, yes, our Bible is a, is a better guide to geology. So in conclusion, <clears throat> uh, Several types of evidence I've mentioned that, that contradict the geological time scale. And I'll talk more about this concept later in another talk. So one, ancient sedimentary deposits are not like modern geological processes. Those rivers just aren't we're not going to cut it. We have these very widespread geologic deposits, hundreds of thousands of square kilometers. The Triassic Morton Formation with its very extensive layers that, that don't form by rivers. The Grand Staircase can only be explained uh, by a major catastrophe. And there is no missing time, even though it's, others have to put that in there if they're accepting radiometric dating. And uh, we'll, I'll show you in another talk how we find answers through research. So all these things give me confidence. Confidence comes from the Bible. But then God uses these, these things, these evidence, to encourage us and show us that the Bible is the, the most reliable source to understand these things. Our faith is a Bible, not on science. But when we build on the foundation of faith, our science gives us better answers 